it's basically Lego plastic for want of a better uh, kind of you know comparison. Uh, whereas this is quite grippy, um, just like neoprene rubber. So these are made by taking a mould. So this is the mould for the palm. And if you take the mould, you put the palm inside, screw it down. You then, just got the C's. There you go. You fill the, the hole there with the, the two-part um, rubber. You then put the top in crush it down and it pushes all the rubber in around the palm and you see it starting to come up out the uh, the air holes here and then when it starts to bubble out all the holes you put it on the shelf leave it somewhere warm and dry for about 16 to 24 hours and you take screws off peel it off and there's a little bit of post process a little bit of sandpaper just clean up the edge like the flashing around the edge where it kind of squeezes out and goes in there you just peel it off your finger down with a bit of sandpaper um so you do that for all the parts and then it's molded on and then you can assemble all the parts and you've got the mechanical assembly of the uh, the hands. But while I was doing this, I was obviously concerned about, well, how am I now going to connect this to Caden? Um, obviously, we don't want to use the NHS arm because, you know, that's going to cost NHS, you know, thousands of pounds every year. Um, you know, we're printing hard plastic. Can we not 3D print the arm as well? So we thought we'd give it a go. So this is my 3D printer printing a socket, which is... Um, the part that connects to Caden. So you can see there, it's got five hours and 45 minutes left. Um, there, uh, five hours, 45 remaining. It's 50% through the print. Um, so it's just over a 10 hour print uh, or 11 hours even. And uh, I thought all is well. So uh, I went to bed uh, and like I normally do, leave the printer running all night. And that's the good thing about the printer printers. They need very little um, monitoring and, and that. Um, but I come back in the morning to find the fact that it got almost to the end. And it detached from the print bed and uh, knocked off the back and ended up with a bit of a spider's web. Um, but it printed enough for us to try it. So you can see here, this kind of outline that goes down, that is effectively the socket I showed you earlier, but uh, a newer version of this. Um, we, my eldest son is a bit of a dab hand at, at 3D graphics and he basically drew this freehand um, in uh, Blender and, um, and played around with it. And we printed that one, which was too small. Uh, we printed this one, which was too big. And just like Goldilocks, uh, we printed the third one, which came out and was absolutely perfect um, and fitted Caden perfectly. So now we've got V3, um, fits absolutely perfect. And Caden said it felt a lot more comfortable than the one the, uh, the hospital do. And this was from a, three, uh, from a hand-drawn 3D model. Um, and the good thing is, this is about 80 pence worth of plastic. So, you know, to replace that, 80 pence, you know, 11 hour print, click print, walk away, come back later. Um, I've since learned that the on the print beds um, with the different materials, I wasn't using any uh, bonding agent um, to bond some of the, the, the larger prints, the print bed, um, which is effectively just a glue stick, um, uh, just like a print stick. Um, I buy the cheap and cheerful, cheapest ones I can find on eBay and just use those to go over the bed. And all that does is helps it when it's hot, it helps it stick to the bed so it doesn't pop off. Um, so now I found that out. Uh, now I've been using the printer for a while and obviously the forums and stuff. Um, you know, I very, very rarely get failed prints. Uh, I've had prints running for three or four days uh, and just lead them to it and off they go. Um, so... Just talking about the cost of just the plastic, just the 3D printed parts. Now the moulds, um, you got uh, all the moulds here. Um, these are all the parts of the moulds. Um, they use a um, slightly different material. Um, they use a PETG, it's called, um, which is uh, uh, a slightly harder wearing material. It's a, a bit more like Lego than the PLA. Um, but it also flexes a little, which means when you're pushing a plunger in, it will kind of move about and flex uh, just a little, just enough that you don't damage and break it because the, the PLA is quite um, brittle. Um, so you can see there, to print all the moulds, cost costs £10, £9.50. Um, and it's £25 uh, for a, a one kilo spool, and it comes in a kilo spool, um, and I'm using kind of you know £10 worth of it. So I could get two lots of moulds at that one spool. So if you're printing this to send a set of molds to somewhere around the world, like I said earlier, I'm an airline pilot. That's what I'm hoping to do with this project. I'd probably print the molds and send the molds down for them rather than letting them print them locally. But if they want them, they're on my GitHub. They can download them and print them um, to the heart's intent. But it saves them having to buy this PETG uh, material. 
Um, but those moulds, I've made about, I estimate about 15 of these hands now, um, at least the, the hardware side of it anyway, the, the plastic. Um, and I'm on the same set of moulds. You can see it's, um, it's pretty used and abused. Um, so uh, the, the moulds are just reusable, you know, unless you're you know, a bit clumsy and, and ham-fisted and break them. The hand parts, though, the, the, the PLA, it's uh, £21 for a kilo spool. I'm spending about five pounds worth of that spool. So you can see there uh, a kilo spool, and I'm using 230, call it 250 grams, a little bit wasted between prints. Um, you know, so you can get quite a few prints of hands out of one spool of filament, um, all for five pounds. Um, the flexible part, the material there, a one kilo spool costs best part of 30 pounds. It's gone up a little bit now. Um, I noticed the other day, um, flexible. But I'm using 20 pence, but I'm using seven grams out of a kilo spool. So one spool will last them for, and as long as they treat it well, keep it airtight in an airtight box or bag um, with some silica gel tablets um, or sachets, uh, it will keep for a long time. Um, if you plan to do any 3D printing and um, you do it with the hard materials, if the, the, the material goes off and you bend it and it just snaps, um, this is off the spool, um, then all you need to do is just stick it in the oven about 50, 60 degrees in the oven for about two, three hours, turn the oven off and let it cool down to room temperature in the oven. So I tend to do it before I go to bed, um, set the oven timer thingy to turn itself off, um, get up in the morning, it's nice and cool, and it rejuvenates the filament because all that's happened is the filament's basically got moisture inside it and you just need to get rid of that moisture. So if you do that um, and let it heat up and then cool down gently, you'll, you'll carry on printing. I've done that quite a few times, but I keep all my filament now in boxes. Um, you can keep it out. PLA is good for four or five days out in the open air. Um, Pet G, probably about a week, week and a half. Um, the flexible stuff, about a day, and it'll go off. Um, but you can't rejuvenate the flexible, sadly. So you just have to be a little bit more careful with that. So without the moulds, the total cost of all the hardware for the hands um, is £5. So, you know, silly cheap. That's crazy. So how do we then control it? So that moved on to the next problem. Um, open Bionics have a, a board they call the chestnut board. Um, they had it open source so you could download the designs um, from GitHub. Um, it's still there now, um, but you then need to get the board made because um, it's a bespoke board that's exceedingly expensive to be made. Um, up until about a year and a half ago, they had a shop um, where you could go into the developer store as such and buy parts. Um, and one of them was a chestnut board. I waited best part of six months for, uh, for a board. Um, and yeah, it just was never in stock, um, constantly contacting them. And I think what was happening was they'd get a batch made, but then they got more orders and the batch they got made. So they used the batch for the orders rather than selling the, um, the surplus onto uh, the makers. Um, so, but that board was 250 pounds plus potion package plus VAT. So not cheap. That's part of 300 pounds. Um, it wasn't cheap at all, um, for essentially an Arduino board, which isn't good. Um, so, you know, and I thought about it, you know, I'm going to give this to a child if he drops it in a puddle, you know, accidentally slips and, you know, or has a water fight and gets water on the board or damages it because, you know, he's moving his hand, you know, and using it in a way he shouldn't do. He's a kid at the end of the day. Um, if he gets damaged, it's another, you know, potentially six, eight months wait uh, and another few hundred pounds, uh, which just didn't sit well with me. So I wasn't keen on this board. Um, so and as I say, it's just an Arduino board. How do we sense the movement? How does that board get told to move the, the hand? Well, at the time, uh, Open Bionics used these uh, MyAware sensors, and uh, they're 35 pounds each. Um, they are, as you can see there, I've got one here somewhere. Um, you can see in the image uh, exactly the same as the picture. So you have the two tabs, and they are just sticky tabs, and just like you have when you have an ECG, um, they stick to the skin, and then you have the fly-off wire, which goes to, uh, so they stick to a muscle group, and you have the fly-off wire, which goes off and sits on a, a non-muscle, so a null area. And if you see there in the image, so the green one in the center is in the perfect place, it's center of the muscle mass, and that gives you a nice noisy signal to say that you know, the muscle's been moved. Um, if you're slightly out of a line though, you get a less noisy picture. Um, and obviously the fly leads goes in the myotendon junction, which is normally a bone or to the side of the muscle, so there's definitely no signal there. Um, so these sticky pads, a pack of 50, um, cost five pounds. Not expensive, but a pack of 50. You need three. You need two of these boards. So you need six per day. 
Um, sometimes more than six per day if they you know take them off and put them on to swimming lesson or something. So six, call it six per day. Um, it's going to last you just over a week. So it's five pound a week for sticky pads. These boards, this one's damaged um, because it's been bent and broken. Um, but the board's just a normal PCB board. So it's pretty fragile. Um, and again, this has got to be stuck to the child's skin. So it's not ideal. Um, it's easily going to break. And uh, I just wasn't very keen on it. Um, but initially, we used these. <coughs> so we stick these. It's not a picture of my muscle. My muscles are much smaller. Hmm. But you can see there where they stick. I'm just going to grab some water. So you see where they stick um, or where my aware um, suggests they stick. But um, this is the fun part, and I can see you all, so I can see you all doing it or not. Um, you can see where we need to stick them for the inside and outside forearm. So if you hold your hand up, arm up like this, get pinch fingers, little pinch fingers like this, and put them either side of your muscle group there. Yeah? So just to the left and right, your thumb. If you then move your 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 hands, open palm out, away from you. Yeah, you can feel the muscle at the back there goes tight. If you move it towards you to close the grip, the muscle at the front goes tight. And if you hold it straight up and just grip your fist, both muscles go tight. Yeah. So that is what we're sensing. We have a sensor at the back, which senses open. Sensor at the front, the sense is closed. And you grip the, the, your fist, both go tight. That means change the next grip in the grip sequence. So you can see there, there's closed, there's open, and we sense those uh, muscle movements. Like I say, if you grip your fist, um, you can change, because you get both sensors uh, triggered at the same time, you can then say, um, move on to the next grip in the grip sequence. Now, open bionics load five grips into their, their board, and the five grips they have is a fist grip, um, just for a uh, fist. This is the palm grip, or as uh, Caden likes to call it, the carrier bag grip, because it's for carrying the shopping. Um, you've got points, a uh, pinch grip, so pinching or saying okay uh, and then you've got tripod grip which is a bit like holding a pencil uh, that sort of thing um, so there's your five grips um, that's all you get um, now Caden's technically only got one with his hook um, but he upgrades to five maybe um, but that's it um, that's what you get that's what's loaded there, that's your choice um, the other thing is if you grip your fist and you go from fist grip to palm grip to point grip and it's like, where are we at? Because I've been doing something else and I was talking to my friend. It's like, well, where's my hand at? Uh, you can actuate it, which means your hand's going to move. It's like, that's the wrong one. I've got to wait till it come back now. Um, and then move on. Right, I want the, I'm at point grip and I want to get to the palm grip. So I've got to go pinch grip, tripod grip, fist grip, palm grip. Right, I'm at the right one. If you miss it, you go around the loop again, which is not ideal. Um, you know, and for younger children, they're going to learn it pretty quickly. But you've always got to have in the back of your mind a little store of, what is my hand currently doing? Um, open bionics have uh, now got run it by putting a, a NeoPixel LED on the back of the hand um, and they change the color of the NeoPixel to say which grip is on. But then you've got to, you know, red is that grip, green is that grip. You've got to remember them. Again, you'll learn it. Um, you know, we're adaptive humans and children are especially good at learning. Um, I've added a, a NeoPixel rather than on the back of the hand because the hand obviously is facing away from you. Um, I've added one on Caden's hand just inside the, uh, the, the, the finger here and thumb so that it's always pointing towards his face um so i've adapted their design and put it there um but it is you know uh, uh, a good way of doing it but how does is that set up in the software so this is the grip array um that is in the uh, arduino software that's loaded into their board and the same is or similar is loaded into uh, what i've done so you have uh, a, a animation timer here just counts from 0 to 100 it's just an integer counts up and it counts up over a given period of time. So I think at the moment we're using about 1.8 seconds. Um, I think initially it was set at two seconds, but we shortened it just to make it a bit quicker. Um, so it just counts up over that time. Uh, at zero, it makes sure that the fingers, so that's the thumb, that's the index finger, that's the middle finger. And then um, F3 and F4, uh, the pinky uh, fingers, um, but they just move together. Um, it's very rare that you move those fingers independently. So there's no point in them having an extra motor, an extra expense, uh, all the control that goes with it. Um, but they've left it in the software. Um, so you can see here at zero, they're all fully open. And then as it starts moving, it gets to 10 and it starts to oppose the thumb. So the thumb comes across. Now, um, the, um, 
motor reading there is uh, up to a thousand. It's just over a thousand, but we go to a thousand. So it moves it three quarters of the way closed. And while the thumbs moving across, it's doing nothing else, nothing else, nothing else. And then when it gets to a hundred, it fully closes the thumb and then fully closes the others. And the idea is that the thumb comes across before the other fingers close. So you can create your fist grip. Yep. You can see the same for the palm. In fact, I zoom in now, I forgot I did that. Um, you can see the same, so uh, thumbs up grip, which is the, the carrier bag grip, um, uh, is another one there. So you can see how the uh, index, and if it's blank there, it just counts from 0 to 100, and it doesn't need to stop. Now, I've explained that to you. We're all software engineers. We can all look at that and say, yeah, I could build a grip. I could build one that holds the Xbox controller that Caden wants. I could build one that, I don't know, uh, can hold uh, whatever it is you want to do. You know, um, You could probably work it out. You know, a bit of uh, a bit of tinkering and playing, you could probably work out a grip, um, and you could probably edit that array. You could probably add a new sixth grip at the end of the uh, the grip array. But now you've added that, you've now got to um, build that code. You've got to have the Arduino build system on your laptop or on your PC. Um, you've then got to upload it to so take the hand apart, upload it up to the hand, um, and then test it, make sure it's correct and iterate and change as we normally do in a normal dev cycle. Then you've got to put the hand back together again because the board is hidden inside um, and then give it to the child and make sure that they're happy with it. So all that tool and effort, that's, you know, it's a good few hours work, if not longer. Um, and we know what we're doing. You know, you could probably download the Arduino software and get this running, you know, in half a day. Um, you'll be up to speed if you've never, even if you've never done it before because you have the software abilities. Um, but, I want, as I said, to be able to take this to someone anywhere around the world and give it to a doctor, a nurse, a technician, and let them build their own grips, let them edit the grip sequence. So instead of having five permanently loaded, get it down to maybe two because they're just at school. I only need the thumbs up grip and an okay grip or thumbs up and hold the pencil grip, whatever it is they need. But when they're at home, they want the Xbox grip. So that's what I wanted. So the drawbacks so far is we've got the open bionics board, single source supplier, Quite often out of stock. It's expensive for an IoT board. Um, the MyWare sensors. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is, as Caden's never used that muscle since birth, in, in his there because it's never used. As he's been using the hand, that muscle group has gotten stronger. So when we're using the uh, MyWare sensors, there's a little potentiometer on the end you need a little screwdriver for, and you just need to tweak up a bit. But because it's a potentiometer, it also changes with temperature. So in the winter, it'd be one setting in the summer it'd be certainly now with the heat it'd be a, a different center um setting so and the board is stuck to the child they're gonna break it it's not a may they will break it um and the pads are five pound for 50. the grips i've just talked about maybe they want their own xbox grip or a, a grip to tell the teacher to go away whatever it is they want um so they're my drawbacks and that's where i wanted to to get to to fix it so i use a lot of adafruit um and uh, Tinsy boards in my IoT projects because they're small, lightweight. Um, you can just plug a uh, LiPo battery into the, the battery here and it's, it, they're phenomenally good. They're really, really good and um, they're, they're great for, for many projects. This one here is an Adafruit Bluefruit M0 and this red board stuck on the end here is a, a Bluetooth um, uh, transmit receiver and you can see the little antenna sitting there. Uh, it's at Atmel uh, ARM M0 uh, chipset, um, the SAM MD21. Um, so it's very similar to the one that Open Bionics use in their board. It's a couple of generations on. Um, but this board is, you know, $20 uh, from the factory, a little bit more expensive for us. We've got to be shipped from New York where it's made. Uh, but, you know, 25 pounds, somewhere around there, maybe a, a touch more. Um, and the good thing is um, I blew one up before NDC uh, London uh, last year, um, so 2019, a couple of days before, and uh, was really upset that uh, Handy was broken, and I didn't have a spare. Um, I ordered one on Amazon Prime. Uh, next day in the morning, postman's knocking at the door and delivering me a couple of these boards. Um, so they're available from Amazon, um, which means they're available anywhere. Um, we can get them pretty much anywhere in the world, um, fairly simply and easily and fairly inexpensively. So that was the board I went with um, for that reason. Um, some specs there. The only um, that come out of that is the fact that it's a similar chipset, so um, the software needed very subtle changes here and there. There's no EEPROM. Um, the Open Bionics board has an EEPROM on board. There's no EEPROM in this, so you have to use the flash. Um, 
and obviously flash the more you use it the more you burn it out um, so you have to just keep moving where you put the memory locations around um, but otherwise it's all the same pwm pins uh, uh, it's 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 fantastic um, and they say light as they call it a feather because it's light as a large feather um, I haven't got a large feather to, to corroborate that but um, there you go so the other board I got was this board here which is a DC motor controller you can see it's of the feather grouping so you can see the pin holes here so this board is designed to sit on top uh, or underneath and the pins match the pins here um, because of the height of the uh, capacitors here um, I didn't have the space, space height wise to stick them on top, but I did have space. You remember the open bonnets board was quite a uh, square board, so I put them side by side. Um, my early design had a, a board underneath, which was just a cross track board, um, like a bit of Vera board. Um, but I've now since gotten rid of that because it's not needed. Um, but that was the, the first build that I come up with. The most challenging part was the end of the motors, the flat ribbon cable. Um, is is connected like this and obviously a through hole so that was a bit of a challenge trying to find a way of connecting those two together um, but I managed to eventually find some parts on RS um, you can see here uh, and I used some ribbon cable and did a bit of soldering under a microscope um, I wasn't over the moon with that because I was trained when I was an engineer um, I spent a couple of weeks learning to solder um, literally in a classroom that's all we did for two weeks was soldering different things um, so, you know, those skills I have because I was taught to do it. Um, but again, I wanted to get around that and I've managed to find a new connector which doesn't need um, to be as uh, good at soldering. You know, um, I can teach anyone to do it in a, in a, a matter of minutes now uh, with the new connector. Um, the other thing we have up here as well is a polylube board. And this is a uh, step down board. I'll come up to what that does in a wee while. But I just wanted to point out that that little board there um, is used to step the voltage down. Um, in, the, uh, in the electronics as well. So going back to our drawbacks list, I've managed to cross off the processor board. It's now dirt cheap. Um, it's not single source, you can get it from anywhere. Um, so next is looking at the muscle sensing. I read the Hackerspace magazine um, and uh, it's a fantastic magazine for all IoT stuff. Um, in edition 17, I was flying off to uh, Japan, somewhere over middle Russia. Um, and reading through it, and I come across this Arduino debugging uh, article. Um, you know, thought I'd give it a read. It's an interesting article. Um, you know, didn't really, you know, I do a lot of Arduino stuff, so it didn't really show me anything new. Um, but what I did see was this sensor um, that he was using, and he was using it to show how to debound switches and things like this. But basically, it's a, a piezoelectric sensor. So much like the buzzer that's in your laptop or your, your, uh, your PC, um, you apply a voltage to it and it makes a sound. This one, you apply a pressure to it and it gives out a micro voltage, um, but only for a few milliseconds. So as you're applying the pressure and they're used um, uh, to detect pressure waves uh, in demolition, most uh, notably, but also inside guitars and violins and things like that, just as a, a, a pickup. Um, and it produces a voltage which the Arduino can measure on the um, uh, analog input. These here are landed in Japan went on Amazon, I bought a pack of 10 for less than a pound. So how Amazon can get these produced wherever they're made in the world and flown or shipped or whatever it is to my house for less than one pound on Amazon Prime, I'd love to know, but they did it. And I think the wire should cost more than that. Um, but you can see how cheap they are. So I got those, fitted them to uh, the arm. We tried it with Caden. And like I said, they just give you a sense of when you've hit them. Um, Caden's muscle was hitting them and it actuated the signal. So I had to change the software. So it just, when he hit it, it just moved the hand to that, 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 that position, which meant that with the MyAware signals, he could apply a bit of pressure and start moving the hand then take the pressure off and it would stop mid, mid, uh, mid action, uh, which means he had a bit more control of what he's doing. And he instantly, given his dues, Caden gives me, you know, good feedback. He said, this isn't, you know, I don't like it. I preferred the other sensors because I could stop the hand in the middle and that meant I could do different things. So, okay, fine, we'll go back to the drawing board. But it did get me onto looking to different sensors. So uh, another website I use a lot of is SparkFun, another American website. Um, and I found their, their force sensitive resistors. Um, as you can see here, as you apply pressure, the more pressure you apply, the more voltage you get out, uh, or the more it changes its resistance. Use the resistor bridge, and you can change the, uh, the voltage that comes into the uh, analog input. Bit more expensive, six pound for a pack of two. Um, 
again, um, bought off uh, Amazon because I wanted to prove the point that I could get these anywhere. Um, these work fantastic. A little bit small for uh, Cadence Muscle Grouping. Um, so we've gone to slightly bigger rectangular ones, which are, I think, uh, I think they're £5.50 each. Um, but again, not that expensive. And he has two of those inside and they stick inside. They're completely flat. And uh, which means we don't need to adapt the, uh, the uh, inside of the, um, the socket. Uh, you can see here, there's the, the small one that is in the, in the video being used. And there's the slightly larger rectangular one. And it's just got a sticky pad on the back. So you peel that off, stick it inside the socket. And uh, these muscles push against it. And because the, the, the plastic is solid, he's pushing against just like there. You, he's holding his thumb still and he's moving his, his index finger to, to apply the pressure. So I came up with my, uh, my design. This, I use this purely, it's my first uh, kind of attempt at doing the fixing design. Um, and it looks a mess, but I just want to point out that actually the motors are connecting to the motor board and then the blue wires are, are coming across and they're the uh, analog signals that run into analog inputs. And then the red and black wires are just doing power around the system. That there takes me about an hour to solder together. Um, someone who's not built it before and not very good with a soldering iron, probably take them, you know, half a day maybe to put together. Um, you know, the next one that will probably take me a, a bit shorter, but you know, within, uh, you know, third or fourth kind of putting together, they'll be down to, similar to me, an hour, hour and a half maybe. Um, it's dead simple uh, design. Uh, you can see here, um, I'm using a, um, a LiPo battery here, and we've got a, a step up and a step down transformer. I mentioned it earlier, um, one of the things that Open Bionics use is a big 14.7-volt uh, uh, battery out of a, uh, an, RC motor, uh, an RC car, so a very controlled car. Um, it's a big, heavy battery. Um, you need a special um, battery charging unit to charge the battery up, um, which is, again, more expensive. And obviously, if it goes flat when you're at school, you've got to wait till you get home or have another charging station at school to charge your, your battery up. This here, what I'm using is an anchor power brick. So that there is a 10,000 milliamp hour power brick that you've probably got two or three in your bag that you carry to and from where you recharge your phone or your tablet with. Um, it's just USB out. It's five volt um, as USB is. So this first one here steps up the five volts to 12 volts and uh, powers, sorry, that one there, powers the um, the motor controller board. And then this second one, which is the one I drew the red circle around earlier, takes the five volts uh, and steps it down to 3.3 volts uh, to supply the, 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 the actual, uh, the boards with uh, their supply voltage for actually working. Um, so that there is 20 pound off Amazon. Payne's got a couple of these now. And um, it means I've gotten rid of, this weighs about, you know, a third the weight of the heavy, uh, battery um, it doesn't last as long but it's usb you can plug it in anywhere and you can carry one of these in your backpack um, to charge up at school um, the downside is that you know as caden's got one of these which is usb he has the tough decision of whether he's going to use his hands or charge his iphone um, or his friend's iphone so you know kids be kids you know it's it's what it is um, but yeah he has he has a couple of those in his backpack that he uses at school and uh, it's works perfect and I've had no issues whatsoever. Um, these boards, um, the Polyloo board is slightly underrated for the motor, but the rating that they give is a continuous rating of 1.8 amps, I think it is. Um, and we're drawing just over two, about 2.3 amps. Um, but we're only drawing it for a second or two and then the motors turn off. Um, so the boards, um, my test one here and the one in Caden's arm, have been running flawlessly and I've never had any issues with that board at all. So I've gone slightly over spec, but it's worked perfectly. So that crosses off our Marware sensors because now we've got the sensors. It's just coming down to the grips now. So I, as I said earlier, I do a lot of Xamarin uh, IoT work. So I thought to myself, well, if we can't change it, we have to literally unscrew the back of the hands to get to the board, to plug in a USB um, cable, to change the software inside. Um, you know, even on the, the, the Adafruit board here, um, this one's, um, you know, you've got to plug in the USB slot at the end. Um, that's, you still got to take it apart. I thought myself, well, why can't I connect to it? It's got Bluetooth. Why can't I connect to it from my mobile phone and control the hands from the phone? Um, so that was 
way I thought. Um, Bluetooth, I hadn't really done much in the Bluetooth. Um, I'd done lots of radio, I'd done lots of um, Wi-Fi, uh, I'd done lots of discrete radio and things like this, but not really much in the way of Bluetooth. Um, not to the level that was needed for this anyway. Um, and initially it's quite confusing. I just grabbed some images off of uh, off the internet. You can see it's umpteen different names for everything. The, the bit it comes down to, you've got classic Bluetooth, which is you know, the old hat one, which does your streaming to things like, you know, your headsets. Um, and that's a constant, always on Bluetooth signal goes back and forwards, uses lots of power. You've got smart Bluetooth or Bluetooth low energy, Bluetooth LE. Um, and what that does is that connects, sends a bit of data and then goes into sleep mode and connects, sends a bit of data back and forwards, goes into sleep mode. Um, so how that works is you have, uh, with Bluetooth, you have a central device, your laptop, your mobile phone, your tablet, and it can connect to lots and lots of peripherals. So if you think about your your uh, your laptop, it's probably connected to your headset, probably connects to your 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 smartwatch, connects to your you know your phone, connects to your car, um, all those uh, things. And it remembers in your your nice long list that you forget to delete the bits out of. Um, but the way it works for LE, as I say, um, when they initially do the handshake, they agree uh, a timing, this uh, connection interval. So they agree uh, the timing setup. Um, say right, every X milliseconds we'll connect the master sends a request and the slave sends a response or, or vice versa but they do this um, do this uh, handshake and then they go to sleep and depend on that connection interval depends on how and depends what data you send uh, depends how long they get to sleep but if you're not sending much data back and forth that sleep time can grow and grow and grow um, to the point where you know it spends a lot of the time asleep and not actually connecting, which means you save a lot of battery power, uh, which is what we wanted because we've gone to a much smaller battery. And obviously we don't want to uh, drain the juice out of his iPhone because he'll unplug his hand and charge his iPhone instead. So, you know, we've got two things to worry about there. So the way it works is, is a bit like a, a, a class. Um, you got your, kind of your class, then your, your, your methods, and then the characteristics will be your, um, your, you know, your, your, your string, your ball, um, that sort of thing inside. So. Um, so if you think about my smartwatch that I've got here, um, that's a Garmin smartwatch. Inside that, I'll have a service, which could be the heart rate, or a service could be the steps. And inside the heart rate, I have the current heart rate, the heart rate the last four hours, the heart rate yesterday, um, the steps today, the steps you know this week. Um, that's how that works. Um, so you just connect to it. And the characteristics, and they all have GUIDs that go with them. So the profile of the service and the characteristics have a GUID to read and write to those. Some of them are read only, some are write only, um, but you get the idea. So if we go across to uh, Visual Studio, and this is um, the uh, connection where I connect to uh, the Bluetooth. So the rest of the software has been adapted and changed quite extensively now from, they called it uh, Beetroot. Um, I'd love to know where they're getting the naming convention from, but um, they called the software Beetroot that's loaded on the boards, and they've, they've kind of, I've adapted it quite heavily now um, because I've kind of stepped away from what they were doing. Anyway, but in the Bluetooth, uh, Arduino, uh, so Adafruit provide these libraries um, to connect to the Bluetooth. Um, I always do a factory reset uh, uh, on boot purely because I want to make sure that the board is uh, got nothing hanging over. Um, I set a minimum firmware version purely because I use some bits that are um, that firmware version on or later. And you can give it a name. So in when it appears in the list in the Bluetooth on the phone, it appears as handy. Um, Caden's arm, I think it's just Caden's arm, I think he calls it. Um, but again, we just set that in a string, and at some point I'm going to make that user changeable in the app as well. Um, it, will it will pull it out of memory. Um, we then set it up, um, we make sure the Bluetooth is disabled, and set up, do a factory reset, and set the device name. Turn off the echo, because the Bluetooth board will echo back all the commands it sends. We don't want that, it's a waste of, uh, of battery power and memory. Um, and then we just start a little timer and start timing. And then when it's connected, so we wait for 10 seconds uh, for it to connect. If we don't connect the phone within the first 10 seconds, the battery coming on, a uh, hand being connected, then we don't allow the Bluetooth connection. And that there is just purely to save battery power. We did have it where it connected, where it'd wake up and try and connect every few minutes. And it's like, well, it's just wasting battery power. If he, if he wants to do it, just, you know, just switch it off, switch it on again, connect his phone, do what he needs to do, and then reboot it again. And it'll have the new settings um, such that we're not wasting battery power on Bluetooth always, or he forgets to disconnect it, that sort of thing. Um, we set the LED behavior of the Bluetooth board, and that's more for me um, looking at this and building it out. And then that's it. 
we say that it's connected, we send a command to the, uh, the phone that uh, Bluetooth LE is connected. And then from then on, we just poll for data um, and it's just basically a, a UART connection, so uh, a serial connection backwards and forwards. And it's we're just doing print lines, just like console dot right line. We're just doing, you know, and we had to uh, overload all the um, all the ones that uh, Adafruit expose, and we just do, you know, print line or, or print value uh, and give a format, and that is it. That is all that was needed to add Bluetooth to this project. Um, one file of what, uh, 170 lines, give or take a bit, and most of that is white space or comments. So you can see it was dead easy to have Bluetooth. And um, a good thing is Open Bionix had a, uh, a file that was added to the project they used for setup, um, where you can literally tap in, you connect to the hand with the USB cable, and you tap in serial commands to connect to the hand and send it commands for setting up in a hospital setting. Um, so all I've done is adapted that and now got that, um, that library to now work with uh, the Bluetooth. So I can send commands from the phone to the hand or you know to get data or set data so again um a few changes but not much in the way of uh, of massive changes to um to this uh where am i going uh, back there so as i say i've now managed to connect the hands uh, and uh, proving the fact that the phone can send these uh, commands back to support so now it's time to move on to an app i use xamarin i'm not going to label this too much so i think i've been talking too long already um but I, I use uh, Xamarin for my mobile apps, um, so it was an obvious choice for me. It's something I knew already. It supported Android, Apple um, quite well, and most importantly, it supported the um, the accessibility functions. So if you use Xamarin, um, when you set the size of text uh, uh, and things like this, if the user's got accessibility settings turned on where they bump that text size by 50%, Xamarin does because at the end of the day, it's turned into a, a iOS button or a, an Android button. The text size is bigger. It's done by the iOS, not by Xamarin. So you, all that kind of accessibility is abstracted away from the project. So on Caden's phone, because he's only got those fingers uh, on that hand, um, his buttons are bigger than what you or I would have. But that's an iOS setting that he's setting his phone. Um, and when you look at the, the phone, uh, the, the app on his phone, all the buttons are bigger. But it works for him. So I don't need to worry about the accessibility. Um, Xamarin Forms uh, and Traditional, the differences are in Traditional, you write C-sharp backend, but then you have to do all the views in the native layer, um, so Objective-C uh, and Java uh, and, uh, and XAML for the Windows one. Um, but with Xamarin Forms, the UI is written in, in XAML as well, uh, a Xamarin XAML, uh, which is different from UWP and WPF. Um, so there is a three flavors and uh, build, they've just announced Maui, which is coming in now, uh, like five, six, um, which is kind of munging all together. And I, I hear that, you know, somehow they're going to sort this out. I don't know how, um, but, you know, it'd be nice if there's one flavor of XAML for everything, but we'll, we'll see what comes out of that uh, going forward. But that meant that I could then just use Xamarin Forms. So if I go to uh, this one here, uh, and I go to the entrance of the app. So this is the uh, the, sh the Xamarin Form shell is also um, was new when I started this project. And what shell does is with Xamarin and Xamarin Forms, you just have to worry about the navigation stack. So you know uh, pushing a new page onto the stack, popping one off. Uh, if you wanted to jump to that page over there, you need to worry about well now when I click the back button, where am I going to go back to? If you're doing um, uh, um, you're running IOC and that, that sort of thing. So you need to worry about kind of keeping hold of that stack and the memory of what happened previously in the stacks and go forward and backwards. With Shell, that's all abstracted away for you. Um, Cause you used to have to go to the, the, you know, I used to go to the Xamarin website and cut and paste a big block of code that was there, drop it into my project, change a couple of bits here and there to fit the project and then crack on. Um, but with Shell, they've abstracted it all the way. So um, literally the navigation is, I wanted the flight header, which is basically a panel that comes out from the left-hand side um, with a menu on it. So I've set a header at the top, which is just a, an image. And then the pages are, are here. So in the fly out, I've got three tab groups. So three tabs, three buttons with icons. Um, and they also appear as tabs along the bottom of the page. So bottom tabs along the bottom. Um, and I give them an icon and I tell them what page um, to go to. So if you click that icon, uh, you go to hand control. If you click that icon, you go to the grip list. Click that icon, you go to the grip builder. Um, and then also in the fly app, but not tabs along the bottom or the top or anywhere else. 
I just got flyout items. So in the menu to the left, I've got extra functionality of uh, UART control, which is more for me than development than uh, for Caden, uh, a Bluetooth connection control, and then the settings view as well, and a muscle sensor check. So in the, in the menu that comes out, I've got extra things. But that is the navigation stack completely done. Um, it's all there um, for you to see, and it's all managed. So I can just say, go to Bluetooth connection, um, you know, uh, async, and it will go to that page. And then if I say, go back, it will go back to whatever was the previous page, um, and it manages that stack for you, um, which is absolutely awesome. And it's taken so much time, effort, and work at building a Xamarin app, and it made it so much simpler. But in the Bluetooth, um, we wanted to connect to it. I mentioned earlier that we had a service in the read and write GUID. So there's a service GUID. Um, there's a read and write GUID to read and write to the uh, um, Adafruit board. Um, they don't have um, uh, many GUIDs inside because they just have a read and write to memory. And then within the board, um, you see that we read and write from the same uh, memory because it's just a serial port backs and forwards. Um, so you set the GUIDs at the top. And then there's just a connect uh, and the uh, adapter that I use um, is uh, a plugin, it's a Bluetooth adapter, it's an, um, um, downloaded from uh, NuGet, it's a fantastic library. And I use that just basically for, uh, and just create a couple of um, events uh, for reading uh, when stuff comes into that um, uh, memory space. And if I send the commands, we just send the string command out. And like I said earlier, it's just a string command um, copying what they did on the keyboard in the hospital setting. So I build that, um, I make changes. I was making changes the other day for Caden and when I finished with the changes, um, I just do a, a git push, push it up to GitHub. Uh, and in GitHub, uh, I have um, uh, App Center, uh, which is, um, or may, you may know it's Hockey App previously. App Center is a mobile build and distribution system that Microsoft have. It monitors my, uh, my branches, my dev and master branch, and it pulls in uh, if it sees a change in that branch, it's uh, you know on push. It builds um, that code for that branch, and then it tests it, and then distributes it out to whoever is in the distribution team for that branch. Um, and then you can get back some diagnostics and analytics. These auth data and push have disappeared now. They've gone into uh, into Azure um, as different services and been much improved. But I do a push, and then. Five, 10 minutes later, Caden gets an email um, on his phone that says there's been an update because he's on the master branch he, and his mum gets the same one, his dad gets the same one. They click update, it updates the app and it's all managed um, for them. It's not in the app store because it's not ready for the app store, but it means that I can push them as test teams. And this uh, app center is completely free. Um, you get a, a limited number of build minutes per uh, month, I think 240 I think it is. I think I have it here, yeah. Uh, 240 build minutes per month. Um, or 30 minutes per build. Xamarin builds take about 10 to 15. Uh, UWP takes about 20, 25 minutes. Um, I don't know why it takes longer, but it does. And it's pushed up. If 240 minutes uh, isn't enough time for you, you can pay £40 a month flat fee and get unlimited. So, you know, it's it's a fantastic um, app center I use for all my projects. Um, and so that uh, comes back to a drawback. Like I've put there, the store's close to the processor, so I'm glad I went away from that. But that means we've got rid of the malware sensor, the processor, and we've gotten rid of the grips. Caden can now make his own grips uh, in the app. Here's the, uh, the boards, here's the electronics um, inside. There's the two sensors. Um, there's the four actuaronics motors, and we've got a Xamarin talking Bluetooth backs and forwards between them. So the costs so far, if we look at the costs um, at the blue foot, Boards is twenty-seven pounds. Remote controller board. Look, add it all up. The most expensive part is the uh, Actronics motors. Four of those. So four hundred and thirty pounds. Next are five pounds for the molds. Um, uh, uh, so without the molds, next are five pounds uh, for the for the uh, the uh, plastic, and then about another eighty to ninety pounds in um, screws, springs, brassware, that sort of thing. Um, and we're just over the 500 pound mark. I've changed some of the parts, some of the mechanical parts. The springs are quite expensive. Um, I've now gone to a different spring, um, which is slightly slacker, but it works, uh, does what it needs to do, and it's about a third of the price. So, and some of the screws I'm changing out, the longer screws, um, and changing the, the hardware design inside the plastic to, to get them. So I'm only using one set of screws. You can just buy one big box and use them throughout the whole build. Um, 
that's my plan um, and I'm working on that at the moment um, with my oldest son to get the design done. Um, so if I go back to the um, hand and if I just close that down a sec and if I come out of, I just stop sharing for the moment. You should see me a little bit bigger. So there's the hands. If I now connect the, uh, that's the power board that uh, takes you from five volts up to 12. I'm about to hold it up for a sec and it do two things at once. And there's handy. So here's the app. So first thing it says, you want to connect to Bluetooth. So we start scanning and it finds all the Bluetooth things in there somewhere. Um, it's not updated the hands yet, but it connects to it. Um, so that takes us into the app. Now if we go into the UART control, we can see, we should see shortly. No, it didn't work, I did it too early. That's what it didn't say. Do it now. There you go. There you go, so now it's connected. Um, you should, if I do a uh, screen share again, what I should have done was that screen two. Share, what I thought I was doing was this, there you go. So that is the app as it's run on my phone. Um, so that is the, the connection. So if I go back to the uh, Bluetooth connection, if I do a start scanning, it's gonna show all the Bluetooth uh, settings that they can see handy appears. We'll go back to the UART, you can see all the things it's done there. Um, and this is what I was saying before, you send a, a G0 as a string over the serial port plugged into the board, it will then send the uh, the command to, to, to do the fist grip. Um, because I come out of that, I just need to do that again. So go into the full cycle. There's handy, you cycle that, and you can see there, it should start filling up the list as it's sending out the commands back and forwards over Bluetooth. Now, if I go to the grip selection, you can see here, this is just a, a carousel view, really, really big buttons uh, came to use, different colors, um, and the idea behind that is that is the color of the LED that I said was on the inside of the hands, and um, that big button there, if I hold this up, if I touch that, it closes the hands, touch it again, and it up, Right now, go to the next one, which is the hook grip. This is the carrier bag grip. So this would be for holding the carrier bags. Um, and then we've got the point adjuster. It's over there, sir. Um, go that way. Um, so you can see all the, um, the different grips are in there. And what we've started doing is you can see a little heart in the top corner there. We've started putting that together such that as you use the heart to, um, to like or favor a grip, when you then go sit at the bottom, we've got the, uh, the grip order. When you go across to the grip order, oh, it's gonna crash. I was messing with this the other day. It will, um, I don't know why as well. I should have, I thought I'd fix that, but I didn't. Um, the grip order will uh, allow, show a long list of the grips that you favorited, and then you can change the order, move them about. And then at the bottom is a massive big save button. Um, this is gonna crash. Uh, yeah, it's timed out. So, um, and the idea is it can change the grips and the order of the grips, it has them. Um, if I just connect, actually I don't need to have the hand connected. Uh, it's come across here, I think that's why. So we're going to the app again. Don't need the hand connected this time. Um, so you can see that's the flyout menu that I talked about before. So everything below the gray line is just the, the flyout items. The things above are on the, the bottom tab bar. So that's that's um, shell for you. Uh, the Bluetooth connection you see in settings, this allows us to change some of the timings. Um, we've also got in there the animation time and things like this uh, to come. Um, you can change, enable and disable the motors and save. Um, and then the muscle sensor check um, this allows Caden to click start and it reads the, the muscle sensors and as he squashes the muscle sensors He can see these values go up and down. It's a bit like a game for him And the idea is that he squashes it and it should just get to the top not hit the top So if it hits the top then the value is is off and it needs to be changed 
Um, so then what we do, if you send for processing, I've got at the moment, it's just going up to uh, an Azure function uh, and it's just being stored in blob storage. And the idea is that I'm going to find someone um, to help with a bit of machine learning to look over that and say, actually, the value needs to be this. And then they can go back into the settings and change the values here, the peak threshold setting uh, and, the, and the whole uh, dwell time setting. And the idea is that we will lock those down and the Azure function will send data back to the app and say, actually, the setting should be this. So he can, it will be changed for him because Caden's a, a clever kid. He's, a, you know, he's 16 almost. Um, but for maybe an eight, nine year old, it might be a bit too complicated for them. So, and then we've got system diagnostics and what that does is push it up the diagnostics again to another Azure function uh, uh, for storage there. So if they're having a problem, we can send up a load of diagnostics in hand up to the cloud uh, for later use. Um, and that is pretty much it. We've got a, a grip builder, uh, which we're still working on. We've not quite worked out how best to do it, but you set steps here in the animation step and you drag the fingers across to where you want them to be. That's where I want them to be at step zero, click add. It, puts it into the list, you move on and you build the grip. And then when you finish, click save. The moment it will save it to the, to the phone uh, and I'm working on the, the communications between the phone, the hands, save it into memory on the hands. Problem is, as I say, I'm a freelance developer, so clients tend to get in the way of, uh, of working on the fun stuff here. I have to go and do a, uh, uh, another app over some forms data. Um, but that is the app. Um, they've all put together. It's all on GitHub. Uh, if you go and uh, play uh, around with, um, the next step was to it's going to move on. The next step I'd like to do is the ML learning um, over the muscle sensor data and the diagnostics to see if there's anything wrong with the hands. But, you know, it'd be nice to go full dot net just for a bit of fun more than anything else. I don't need to do it, but it'd be just be for fun. Um, I'm not sure you guys have heard about this, but um, Wilderness Labs uh, released the Wilderness board or the F7 Meadow, uh, which is a wee little board here. And you'll notice that if you take the red box bit off, this pin out here and this footprint here is identical to the feather board that I use inside the hand already. So it's a drop-in replacement. And I can then use .NET uh, on this board and everything would be in C-sharp and .NET uh, from end to end. Um, I've started tinkering and playing at the moment. The uh, F7 has still got some issues with the Bluetooth stack. Um, it's still in beta release. Uh, beta release 4 comes out imminently, um, which should fix most of those issues. And then um, the motor controller board I talked about earlier, they don't have a library for that in .NET. So I'm planning to write one. Um, uh, I've committed to some friends. I'm going to write it on a Twitch stream um, just for fun. And so come and watch me do it there. You see me tweeting about it on, uh, on Twitter. Um, and the idea is uh, once that library is written, everything else is, is fairly simple. It also means that this board has over-the-air updates, as you can see. Um, and because we have over the air updates and it's got Wi Fi on board, when Caden or another child gets home and they've got Wi Fi connection, we can push an update to the board, which means if I make a change because I found a better way of doing things or we want to add more functionality, I can update the hand, which means I don't need to go to some remote part of the world to update the software or send it out. I can literally just push an over air update to the hand. Um, there's obviously security in that around that, but we'll, we'll resolve that when we get that far. But that's the plan going forward. Um, I've mentioned it a few times going um, through the talk of why I talked about being a pilot. My aim now, and it's been talking to a few um, people at conferences, and it come from um, NDC Oslo, I think it was last year. Um, someone was saying about, um, you know, why don't you just take these around the world? You know, the price, the cheapness. I think someone mentioned the part of the world where there's lots of people with, uh, with uh, limb loss. Um, my dream now is to get a 3D printer from Perusa um, for £700, all the filament and bits and bobs, stick them in a box and, uh, and take the box some part of the world uh, and go and spend a, a day or two with the technicians and the medical team there, show them how to use it, do a couple of trips over the course of a couple of months um, to the same location and, and help them build up the, the ability to build these arms. Um, I'm looking for a location, so if anyone knows somewhere in the world, um, that's on the uh, on the network then you know ping me a message my dms are open and it'd be nice to go and kind of finish off the project um, i'm looking for another willing um, participant in the project in the uk that i can work with um, caden's been fantastic but i'd like to get another person for you um, you never really want to go with, you know uh, one kind of view i'd like to get another person for you because they may have different insights that's basically the project. Um, I just want to say thanks to Caden. He's been absolutely amazing. Um, there's been some times where it's, you know, he sent me away with my towel between my legs, but, you know, 
it's always been going back with right we've solved that um, i also want to say thanks to sharon and and, uh, and paul his parents um who've been fantastic help through this whole project if this has excited you you want to jump in um that's the github link to the uh xamarin app uh if you go to um, cliff ages slash handy there's uh, the other repos the one for the uh, bruno hand that was forked and has been adapted um, the one for the arm and the socket is on there as well and all the electronics is on there i'm never going to close source these i don't plan to turn it into business or sell them um, i only ever plan to help people out if someone wants one and they've got a bit of money to pay for the motors fantastic but the idea is i want to give this design uh, and everything else across to people so they can make them wherever they are in the world um, so thank you very much any questions amazing absolutely amazing brilliant yeah um yeah if anyone's got any questions please fire away there's an extra person We've got a dog in the room <laughs> can i uh, just ask you something about uh, what you mentioned right at the end there which i, I guess is of interest to, to a lot of people here is the presumably uh, in the board you've got you've got to load the arduino version of the sort of what i think was the firmware for the Yep. And onto the device, but you suggesting now with the uh, Wilderness Labs um, new board that you could get away from that, and you can over Wi-Fi or something like that. You can up or rather over the internet, you can update it. Yep. What's the what? What do you can you just tell us a little bit more about that Wilderness Labs and the .NET and and, and how it's, we'd be able to use that? It's, it's basically it's um, it's got a, a, a exceedingly cut down version of the Mono runtime on there. Um, so it uses um, .NET, uh, and you push your code down to uh, the board, uh, loading it over um, the USB port, as you would with the Adafruit boards, and then you set it up with over-the-air updates. Um, they've not come out with too much detail about the over-the-air updates, but it is in the pipeline. Um, but that is just then you just write normal C sharp just like you would any other application and you know for a pc you know treat it like a raspberry pi you write your dot net and push it to a raspberry pi it is just like that um, so there are libraries, got... sorry i was gonna so, say the libraries that give you access to the the hardware that's yes yeah right. yeah just like the raspberry pi um dot net has got the gpio libraries built in yeah. um so they've the wilderness team uh, uh are all ex microsoft people or ex xamarin people um, they've not had to rewrite the GPO libraries because they're part of .NET. They're there as .NET Core because you use .NET Core on a Raspberry Pi, um, you can control the hardware there. So they've not had to do that, but they have had to write libraries for doing things like you know, um, the serial comms and stuff because the way the hardware of the board is different to a Raspberry Pi um, and that sort of thing. But um, it's I've tinkered and played with it quite a bit. Um, I've got a couple of these now. Um, they are absolutely fantastic and you just write normal C sharp, push it down and it automatically works. Um, Bluetooth doesn't work at the moment. Wi-Fi in the latest bait release is a bit iffy, um, but they had a dev camp, uh, I think it was the day after build, the, last, the day after the last day of build, so last Friday I think it was, um, and they sort of said what they they just pushed out live that day of the last bait release. I've not tested that yet, uh, but it seemed to fix a lot of the problems. Um, and the Bluetooth is going to be fixed in beta release four, which is also the release candidate, which is out at the end of July, I believe is on their, their roadmap. So, you know, if you used to buy one of these, they're $50, um, they come from the U S um, it's a little bit for post and package. Um, if you get one, you can just write normal C sharp and you've got an IOT board that is battery backs, unlike a Raspberry Pi, you try and run a Raspberry Pi for battery. It's not going to last very long. Um, but this with you know a battery like that or even a small lipo battery is going to last um days and days and days and um, you can run that off a coin cell battery a little 2032 battery um for you know a day or so um it's you know depend on what you're doing with the io obviously if you're putting a lot of power driving an led it's going to drive the battery down but if you're just using that to do some some sensing and, and, and stuff it's not going to use a lot of power at all so yeah they're fantastic and i want to go across to it because it gives me some extra bits, but also because I like C Sharp and I, I detest Arduino. Um, I use it because I have to, but it's it's a pain. So uh, just a quick, anyone do any Arduino work? Okay. Oh, work. I've, I've done some Netduino. Yeah, uh, Wilderness Labs have literally, they announced last Friday that they've killed Netduino now. Mm. Um, they bought the rights to it and killed it because they've moved across to this, but yeah. 
Um, no. If you do any Arduino work um, and you download the Arduino IDE, um, you have to download it and install it because you get all the drivers and parts, but then you don't use it. Use VS Code or Visual Studio. Um, the Arduino IDE is, is basically Notepad++ compared to Visual Studio. It is really basic. It does the job and it's good for you know, use in schools where you're not trying to do everything. VS Code basically just puts a VS Code kind of um, skin over Visual Studio IDE, um, uh, over the Arduino IDE, which means you're using VS Code and it looks and feels a little bit nicer to us, but it's still the Arduino IDE underneath. And all it's doing is pushing the commands back and forth on the, uh, on the command line to it underneath. If you go to Visual Studio, um, there's a plugin for Visual Studio called uh, VS Micro. Um, it's completely free. Um, but I highly recommend you, you pay the, the, the 40 pounds, I think it is, uh, for a, 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 a license. Uh, that plugs into Visual Studio and allows you to use Visual Studio. And it also, the benefit you get from that is, unlike Arduino, you can't debug unless you, you know, the debugging in IoT is to flash an LED on and off, a bit like print line to the console. Um, that is a pain. You know, just you imagine writing a project where you have to console.write line to do your debugging. That was old school. We hated it. That's what you do with Arduino and Visual Studio Code. With Visual Micro inside Visual Studio uh, 2019, you then get your uh, F9 debugging back. Um, you can put breakpoints in, and the very, very clever way he's done it. I can't remember the guy's name that wrote it. I'd, I'd love to go and buy him a, a whole case of beers. Um, is you put an F9 breakpoint, you then recompile the code and push it down. And what it does, it does a, a while loop um, in your code. So it inserts a, a very small amount of code um, into your code base. And then when it hits that, it goes running around the loop and just sits there doing nothing. And then when you press uh, F5 or F11 or whatever it is to continue on, it then goes on to the next breakpoint. So you have to set more breakpoints than you normally would. Um, but while you're in a breakpoint, you can look at kind of a few local variables around it or do console.writeline or debug.writeline and it pushes, it pulls it out of memory and sticks it into the, uh, the watch for you. Um, so you get kind of not all the way there, but you get most of the way there. And he's always iterating on the, on the design. Um, it's fantastic. And as I say, it's free or pay 40 pounds, I think it is for, for the license. Uh, I bought the license because, you know, uh, means I can drop him an email if I've got a question. Um, but yeah, and it supports all the big, you know, Adafruit, all the Arduino boards, the Tinsy boards, um, you know, everything you can think of is all in there. Um, yeah, it works really, really well. Any other questions? Uh, did you set that for uh, Visual Micro, sorry? Visual Micro, yeah. Yeah, cheers. That is brilliant. What do you do for, yeah, what do you um, uh, design your 3D prints on? Um, the hand has been all done in Blender. Um, if you've not used Blender, it's a bit like kind of uh, like a modeling kind of um, 3D modeling uh, It's used in the, the, the games and film industry, that sort of thing, for making kind of models. Um, you can go into like a clay work may, uh, way where you kind of put clay on and carve it off. There's lots of, it's an exceedingly powerful bit of software. Um, I can't understand it. It's too complicated for me. And my brain doesn't think that way. Um, but my oldest son, Macaulay, he's a dab hand at it and he's great. Um, you can also use uh, Fusion 360. Um, uh, that's a blender's free fusion 360 is paid for. Um, it's a little bit easier. I can get my head around that. It's a bit more like CAD cam. Um, so you draw like a box and you can pull it up. Um, a bit like if you've ever used SketchUp from Google or, or yeah. I think it's Trimble, I, 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 think use, it is now. I used Autodesk 360, the free version, but I, yeah. I'm, a free, I'm not clever enough to use it. No, I'm not either. So, um, yeah. yeah. The software I use if it's a fairly simple model, um, so making cases uh, for a lot of my IoT projects, um, uh, there's loads around somewhere, um, making just a simple case for an IoT project or making, you know, something a little bit more complicated. Um, and I've used this in school. So at my son's school, they all did a, 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 a DT lesson where they all used this. It's a bit of software called Tinkercad. It's completely oh. free. It's all in the browser. And basically you drag a cube across, reshape the cube, and you tell it that's part of the model or if it's a hole of the model, so you can make a cube and put a cylinder through the center and say that's, that is a hole, so subtract it, and it's just add and subtract, and, and, it becomes, and then you group it all together and it becomes your model. Um, it's dead, dead simple to use, um, and I use that for my 
the stuff that I need to design because I can think that way. And if, you know, nine, 10 year old kids can use it in school, then I, I can almost make it work. Um, and what they did was they designed it and then I, I got a USB stick with all the, the models on and I set my printer to work and print off the bits for them and they all took them to school. Um, so yeah, you know, but it's, it's pennies in plastic. Um, you know, and the, the price of the plastics is coming down all the time as well. Oh. So, Any other question? I think quite a lot of libraries, like I know the libraries in uh, York have got 3D printers now. They've got like four, I think it is, what they get kids to play around with and on like Saturdays. Well, obviously not at the moment, but. There's loads of hack spaces. You know, yeah. You hack space. There's bureau services you can use. Um, Which is quite cool. Yeah. There's a, a bureau service, the Prusa printers that I've got. Um, if you go on there, you can go to the uh, prusa.org uh, and you go on there and there's a long list of all the models um, you can download. So, um, you know, I needed a new part for uh, for the Hoover, for the Dyson. And uh, rather than buy it from Dyson, I went on there and someone's already designed it for me. Um, so I clicked download, downloaded it, and um, and uh, and click print. And I got a new part and stuck it on the Hoover and away I went. Um, I've printed knobs for the cooker um, at our previous house. Um, you know, you just print these parts out and download them. And then uh, if you want to down look for models and parts, if you go into Thingiverse, um, it's uh, by the MakerBot team, and there's thousands upon thousands of models on there. Prusa have made their own library now where the models are sliced, and you can also click uh, to buy the model, and then it will come through to a local person like myself, and then we agree how many beers um, for that, that part, and then I'll print it and either drop it around to you because it's local or, or post it to you or whatever. So if there is, you don't want to spend seven, eight, nine hundred pounds on a printer or you don't want to buy a, an Ender 3, which is like the kind of base model, about 200 pounds, about 180 pounds. They're quite slow. Um, they're, they're, they do the job, but they're, they're not brilliant. And they take a lot of setting up and a lot more hands in. Whereas this, if you used to send me a model, uh, a G-code model, I could stick it in a printer, click print and walk away from it and be quite happy that it's going to print and I'll come back in the morning and have the part there. Um, so yeah, if, you, if you're if you just trying to download and print models, you can do that way as well. So your advice is it's well worth spending the money on something like a Prusa? Yeah, some of the better printers, an Ender 5, a Prusa, um, uh, the, the higher, you know, spend a, a bit more. It's like all things, isn't it? You get what you pay for. Um, the good thing about the Prusas is they alter bed level. So every time you start a print, it, it pops around nine points on the bed and works out how level the bed is, and then does some mesh work inside the memory and then says, well, I know that at that point, I've got to be a little bit higher, but at that point, a little bit deeper because I've, I, and it changes it on board the, uh, the, the machine. If you're using like an Ender 3, um, you have to level the bed yourself and put in bits of kitchen foil underneath the glass plate. Um, you have to, you know, every couple of prints, you have to, you know, rehome the, the, um, the head and tell it, right, that is 0 0.2 millimeter from the bed and using shims and things like this. It's, it's not hard. And my old um, Rat Rat Mendel used that method. Um, but you get a temperature change from quite cool to quite warm or quite warm to quite cool. And those printers tend not to cope very well. So an overnight print where the room temperature drops, um, it could go outside the range of melting the plastic and you come down in the morning and have a mess. Yeah, I don't but think you, I could sleep, to be honest. Yeah. Whereas the Prusa printers take that into account and they, they adapt. Um, and work it out for you. I don't know what magic they're doing there, but it works. So, um, to the point where one of my printers is set up on a, uh, I've got a Raspberry Pi plugged into it uh, with OctoPrint, and then that is uh, out of my network, so I can, anywhere in the world, um, see my printer doing its thing, or send it print files to print, even start it printing if I choose to. Um, you know, there's an app on your phone as well, OctoPrint app, so you can control your your, your your printer from anywhere. Right. Very cool. Any questions? Well, thanks a lot, Cliff. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Really, really, yeah. really good. Thank you. Really yeah. good. That. Yeah. My, my hat is doffed to you, sir. Yeah. I, that is Thank a you. fine achievement you've done there. Um, it's it's been a fun project, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's been a couple of years. But once I got stuck into it, it was like, well, I want to finish it now, and it's. But like I say, clients keep getting in the way. That's why it's taking so long. When is it going to be finished? What, what's the, what's the Well, Kay, Caden's got one. Uh, he's got his one. His one is printed in this, um, this black kind of metallic 
Um, you can see it just glints uh, in the light there. You can see the, the brass inserts I was showing you earlier just pushed in. Um, so Caden's one is, uh, is complete. He's wearing it um, and using it. Um, you know, he doesn't use it all day, every day because there's bits of it he's still getting used to. There's bits of it he still prefers his hook for. Um, Caden uh, is hoping to be a, a chef. Um, given all of the things against him in life, that's what he, that's what his dream is to be a chef. Um, he's been working over the, during the COVID period in a, uh, a local um, uh, food kitchen, helping prepare foods for um, families that need it. Um, plastic melts. His metal hook doesn't, so he's in charge of the oven. Uh, and if he slips with a knife, he can't chop a finger off because they're not there. It's metal, and it will damage the knife before it damages the hook. So he's been using his hook every day because um, he can. Um, do that sort of thing but with the hands he can Chef hold a tomato Chef he can hold, yeah he can hold a tomato or a cucumber or you know uh, you know pick up a bit of broccoli which he can't do with the hook so you know things like that uh, are, he's kind of slowly moving across but he's not there yet um, and that's why another reason why I want to find another child to, to, to test this with and see if there's something we can do different sure. well thanks a lot hey welcome um, everyone, next next month yeah, is John, John Skeet. Uh, have you seen his drum presentation before? He assures me it's moved on because he's working on it furiously. Um, RSVP is open as of, well, very, uh, I think now. Um, so you go ahead and look forward to it. I just say I, I had, a, I had a, a message from a from, um, uh, guy who works for me who wanted to um, join and he was, he was wondering if he'd changed the password. So, I'm wondering if a few sort of got locked out, maybe, or something. No, um, I, I only sent it out 20 minutes ago. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, might need to improve that. Like, otherwise, the, otherwise you the, get the, Zoom. You have, to, you have to chase the, the email, didn't you? I know one of the other groups I spoke at, they didn't password protect the Zoom thing. They just made it such that the, um, the uh, host had to let them in. And what they did then was they had the list that were on um meetup.org and and then compared the names to the list and said right okay yeah cliff can come in matt can come in john can come in who's this you know rupert guy i'm not letting them in that sort of thing answer um, answer uh, whether that works or not i don't know but it's just what i've seen at another mm -hmm. an, another meetup doing this this where well, it was one of my other talks but um but yeah um maybe that work so is oh, john allowed to play the drums yet or is he still just writing code to learn how to play the drums i think he's been playing for a while when I saw his talk at NDC, like uh, in London, he was, uh, he had, I think he only played it about a few times. He was just writing code. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Come to the talk, find out. Yeah, I will. I will. Or, or maybe his drumming's improved. <laughs> or, or it's like one of those pianos that played himself. He's pretending to play the drums, but really not plugged in. <laughs> yeah. Pet shop boys. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Cool. Well, see you next month, hopefully. Great. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye. Yeah, bye.